Don't be afraid to ask for references of people that they borrowed money from. If you're feeling that the borrower is being resistant, then they're not being grateful for the capital that you worked hard to get. It shouldn't feel strained. It shouldn't feel like, oh, it's so difficult to get any information from this borrower. The best practices that you prioritize for your uh, deal analysis, what are some of the first things you look at? If I had to just say one thing to deliver, die by, you know, there's obviously a lot that you need, but the very first thing is... Welcome to season two of Nursing Real Wealth. I'm thrilled to kick off this season with an incredible lineup of guests who are here to share their insights and experience in the world of private money lending and real estate. Together, we're uh, today we're bringing back uh, Eric and Logan Bowers from Congregation Capital, who were guests on our show during season one. Uh, welcome, Eric and Logan. Good to be back. Glad to have you guys back. Um, in addition to Eric and Logan, we're also going to be joined by a friend of mine, uh, Greg Crane, whose journey in private money lending has been both challenging and inspiring. Despite facing some tough deals last year, Greg has shown incredible resilience and determination in navigating the learning curve of this industry. Uh, so in this episode, we're going to be delving into some of Greg's experiences, including, um, dealing with foreclosures on properties and extract some valuable takeaways that he's eager to share with us. Uh, and then Logan and Eric are going to analyze one of Greg's deals uh, that resulted in a foreclosure. And through their expertise, we aim to highlight some best practices that have enabled Eric and Logan to lend full time without encountering foreclosures to date. Greg, thank you so much for joining us and bringing value to our community. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me, man. You bet. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive right in. Greg, maybe just uh, give us a little bit of a backdrop to, to the story we're going to be sharing today. And how, how was your year last year? <laughs> it was crazy. Um, I, I started in the Gator program in uh, April and, um, you know, focused my my business strategy on just networking within the group as deeply and intensely as possible. The group is very giving and and focused on creating community, so I really uh, gravitated towards that, and so uh, just made it a practice to to reach out to as many people as possible and try to learn from them and also find opportunities that way. Also, did a lot of networking, you know, outside in other Facebook groups, in local REI groups, and just you know really leaned into the the connector avatar as what was going to be my focus. Um, so. There are connectors in our group, and uh, so I connected with a few of those, one of whom brought me this deal about um, a month and a half after I started. Um, and, you know, on the surface, it looked really great, first position, uh, a connector who seemed to be really active in the community, and I, I enjoyed talking to and felt was um, really knowledgeable and and reasonable. Uh, and the thing that made this appealing to me, first of all, was a great return, you know, over 20% for four months. And it was the first position. Um, and it was quote unquote, cross collateralized. Now being six weeks into the program, uh, I didn't quite, you know, have a great understanding of what that meant. Uh, you know, like, little did I know that actually means that you have to have a, a security instrument that is in your name against this cross collateral property. So, um, you know, there was a primary residence that was due to be refinanced and that was the exit strategy um, to, to be able to, to pay me out in the four months. Um, and, you know, like I said, in the pre-show, there's a, a myriad of things that I've, I've learned from this, um, and kind of what I preach to people who are new, which is underwriting both the person you're, you're working with, as well as the property, as well as the exit strategy. And all of those things need, um, really intense scrutiny and, and deep research. So, um, uh, and I, I sort of you know, read a great book called, um, what was it? Yeah, I, I actually, it was a Bigger Pockets private money book that I read that was all about, you know, evaluating the character of the borrower. Uh, meanwhile, I didn't take any of that to heart. I did one, uh, I had one person in common on Facebook with the borrower, reached out to him. He said he knew him, but hadn't done any deals with him. Um, but looking back on it, in the, in the pit of my stomach, there was a, a, an odd feeling about this individual. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's been a ride. I can, uh, 
definitely dive into the nuts and bolts of it now if you want. And okay. Um, so the loan for 74 K, um, that was hundred percent of the purchase price. Uh, the connector got a $2,000 fee from the borrower as well as was extracting a $5,000 fee from on the back end at closing. Uh, I was due to make 20,000 as a, as a return on that for a four month lend. Uh, as I said, it was first position quote unquote, cross collateralized by this, this primary residence in Florida. Um, I developed a good relationship with the realtor who was sort of realtor investor who was brokering the deal. And, you know, she was giving me some character analysis on the, the two of them. It was a, um, it was this guy and his girlfriend and his girlfriend was actually the LLC that was going to be on the, on the paperwork. And, you know, she had her own business and she had this pri uh, primary residence in Florida that uh, on the surface had a lot of equity in it. Right. So I saw a mortgage statement to confirm what was the, the first lien on it. Um, but like I said earlier, a, a true cross collateralization would be a, a, a second, you know, um, security instrument against that, uh, that residence. Looking back, I'm glad that I didn't take the only security as that primary residence because they ended up foreclosing on that because like I said, these folks were not very, um, savvy business people and have gotten uh, into a lot of hot water and have burned a lot of people in our community. So it was somewhat reassuring to know that I wasn't the only person um, having problems with them. So um, we closed on this in May, um, came to find out, you know, soon after that they were in a lot of bad deals and I needed to kind of be flexible in terms of the return that I was asking to try and allow them a better opportunity to, um, to pay me out. So I immediately renegotiated a lower return on my um, money because I wanted to make it easier for, for her to try to refinance or get a hard money loan to pay me out. Um, they worked with someone else in our community to get a credit sponsor, uh, <laughs> formed an LLC with a credit sponsor so that they could get a hard money loan to pay me off. So I, I was sort of strung along for five or six months on this deal until finally it just people kept dropping out and they were uh, proven to be pretty uh, unsavory partners. Uh, and at which point um, the, the girlfriend uh, was pretty uh, open to working with me in whatever way, you know, she wasn't going to fight me on the default. So um, I got a deed in lieu of foreclosure uh, drafted by a title company. She signed that and I, I took over the deed to the property. And currently I'm four days away from closing on the resale of this property for uh, a significant uh, loss from my original uh, investment. But for me, it's been such a nightmare in terms of dealing with these people, you know, trying to do something remotely, dealing with my self-directed IRA, which was the custodian on this deal, that I just felt I'm not going to put more money into this property to try and fix it up uh, to then hold it as a rental in my IRA. I'm just going to, um, you know, sell it for what I can get for it and and move on to the next deal. Um, so that's it in, in a nutshell. Um like I said, it was pretty, one of the biggest problems was that the, the condition of the property was, was, uh, pretty janky. You know, there's a mold issue in the basement, the roof needed to be redone. So when, um, dealing with my exit strategy, once I took it back, um, you know, trying to hold it or get back all of my capital seemed, um, kind of impossible. Yeah. Questions? Well, that is, that's quite a lineup. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, uh, before we get too much into like nuts and bolts, I'd love to get into a little bit of like, even just philosophy of, uh, um, you know, what drives you? Because I feel like a lot of people would, would experience that and say, you know what, forget this. I'm done with this real estate thing. I'm gonna throw my money into an in index fund and I'm just going to let whoever the heck runs those index funds do their thing. And I'm just going to go to the day job and call it. What, well, what, uh, what is the purpose that you have that drives you to keep pursuing what, what you know is available out there in real estate? Well, because I know it's available and I know that it can be done if it's done smartly and wisely. Um, this is also 2.0 of my real estate journey. Um, in 2007, I was um, transitioning. I went to school for theater uh, and quickly realized that that wasn't going to be a sustainable uh, career for me. Uh, I was just about to have a child 
had inherited some money um, from unfortunately a passing in my family and was like all in on real estate, went to the seminars, what, you know, tried to do some deals, but similar to this one, didn't really know what I was doing. And, um, you know, it scared me off it for a long time, uh, challenged my relationship. Uh, I was just about to be a father and was just trying to like, you know, figure out how I was going to uh, provide in that way. So when I re-entered in this, I was determined to do things the right way. And I, I, like I said, before this, we started taping, I have had several deals that have gone well. It will be a positive year. Um, God willing that the rest of my deals, uh, you know, close as they're supposed to. Um, but more than anything, I've just um, developed such a, a robust network of people that I want to do, do partnerships with. And so, and, you know, kind of establish a, a small, like you said uh, before, somewhat of a leadership role within my micro community and larger community. And so, you know, quitting isn't really an option. And like I said, I, I feel like this is a great business. It's also a really scary business, like full of pitfalls. Um, and so the only option is sort of forward. Yeah. I just came from uh, WealthCon, uh, Ryan Pineda's event, which was great. Uh, so very uh, just a, just a <laughs> mind expanding opportunity to to listen to to a lot of those speakers, but um, Ryan actually said something that um, I think was really good. He said your purpose needs to be greater than the cost. So um, you know you're going to experience loss. You're going to you're going to experience challenges along the way. So he he was just really challenging people. You know you, you got to have a strong purpose. And, uh, I think, I think that sounds like that's, that's kind of what you got there, Greg, you know, you're, you're, you're working with, um, a very clear, uh, vision of what you know you can achieve. And, uh, so even though you've experienced some challenges this year, it's not enough to, um, you know, put you down. So that's, that's phenomenal. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you know, those of us that have families, our purpose is our family. Um, I also feel like my purpose is is this community that I'm building because one of the things I look forward to doing is helping people, <laughs> um, you know, be successful in this business and in, in being entrepreneurs as I learn how to do it myself. Um, so, uh, and I've, I've already kind of gone through it and I l lost, I, I say I lost, but I was, you know, working in the corporate world and everything, but I lost 15 years between that experience and this one where I feel like I could have been, you know, investing and growing my, my portfolio. So, um, trying to make up for some lost time there. I've got two kids who are pretty smart who are going to need to go to some pretty good colleges in the next couple of years. So, um, that's definitely, um, the other thing that's driving me on. So how have your experiences with this deal and just, you know, your overall experiences this year, uh, especially the foreclosures shaped your perspectives and strategies in private money lending? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's made me definitely trigger shy. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, you know, I'm still closing out deals and evaluating a lot of other ones, but, um, I think the main thing that's made me the most trigger shy is I have a deep sense of, uh, foreboding about what this year is going to be economically, um, and what the market's going to be, what the credit market is going to be. Um, was talking with a really experienced TC the other day was saying as we go into the election and go into the tail end of the year, like things could really dry up. And so um, I think that experience of being burned and not really trusting my my own judgment, um, plus what I kind of see on the horizon has just kind of made it, um, it's made me wonder where to really be putting my focus. And I, I think the the answer that I get is I want to own more assets and I want to use private money lending to, and I know, you know, Eric and Logan, you guys do this a lot is, is being using private money partnerships to acquire equity and in, in other assets. So that's really where I'm shifting versus that sort of three to four months high return, but, but high risk. And, and the other thing is just really scrutinizing who you're, who you're partnering with, what are their resources? What are their um, reserves? Um, who are their references? Just, just really, you know, leaning in more fully into that. I want to make a real quick comment about, you know, we, we're, we're often told, especially when we enter a mentorship, right. Or even from these stages, this is something I heard often and at WealthCon, you got to take action. You got to take action. 
And I think there's a big difference between taking action and FOMO. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, I don't know. I just read what I posted the other day, but like social media and especially in these communities that we're in, it, it creates this sort of overdose of, well, I don't know if it's dopamine or serotonin, but whatever that, that drug is that, that says, Oh my God, this is it's so easy. And I could do it so fast and I can make this money so quickly. And I, you know, I refocused on networking at the beginning of the year because, you know, I felt like I was coming out of the woods and I wanted to, you know, reassert myself as a connector and just meet other people in the sub two community. And was just hearing bad story after bad story and was like trying to wonder what the common thread was. And it's just, you know, we're all kind of drinking from this same, um, you know, social media is a real, it, it's, it's great to bring us together, but it's also poisonous in what it sort of does to, to us psychologically. Um, and so when I look at this deal that I got into and how quickly it was after I started, you know, it doesn't really surprise me. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Eric, Logan, any, any commentary on, on what we kind of heard here? Oh, I mean, I could talk for an hour about this. Um, I do want to just acknowledge a couple of things before we get into like questions and stuff or, you know, in the deal specific. Well, one, First off, kudos to you, Greg, for just staying in this and seeing it through and taking action. Um, the second thing that just kind of stood out to me as you were talking and answering those questions is that this perception that we will not have loss in business is a lot of the driver of people having the ability to sell courses in education. And those things are great. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of educating and learning, but... I think the perception that if when we get in business, if we do everything right, we're not going to have losses is just a fallacy that most of us believe when we start doing business or doing real estate deals. It's like, if you do enough deals, if you stay in the game, you're going to have losses. You're going to have lawsuits. Like you're going to get punched in the face, right? Like it's just part of the game and how you recover from those punches is way more important than missing the punches because you could have been told a thousand times, to protect this deal but you experiencing it viscerally you will never forget <laughs> the lessons that you learned here and they they will never be things that you repeat right so like there's super value in i know it sucks to lose money but like there's super value in that process and going through that um and i would say that it's better to go through a deal and come out with your perspective even though you lost money, then never do a deal at all. So anyways, those were a couple of things that just stood out to me that I just wanted to share um, that I thought were important, you know, to highlight and, and what you said. Totally agree. Yep. Uh, I agree with that a hundred percent. You know, you can watch YouTube videos all day long. You can watch course videos, you can read books, but when you actually have to write a check to sell a flip or you realize that you're paying the mortgage, the costs on a rental and the rental income is not equaling that. And you see your bank account going down that teaches you to scrutinize things so much better and deeper that you, you really learn a lot. You learn to be skeptical. You learn to do better due diligence. You learn to just be a better investor. Um, about your specific deal. I'm hungry to hear a lot more of the details on like the, uh, if you're comfortable sharing the state, the city, like the bed, bath, square foot, like what was the ARV supposed to be? Like, was there a scope of work? Like that's usually how we get down to more of the nuts and bolts to see like, okay, what's the risk of us losing money on this? How can we value it? How much of a hassle would it be if we had to fix it up and resell it? All that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go ahead. We can dive right into that. Um, Greg, I don't know if at the bottom of your screen, do you see an option to present? Yeah. Perfect. Feel free. I haven't really explored those tools much, but we'll we'll see if we can present oh, a little it. bit today. I'm a tech guy, man. I work for I love it. Uh, can you see Safari? There we are. Yeah. So this property, it's in Ferguson, which already, if you... Um, you know, Ferguson is kind of where those riots were back in 2015 uh, outside of St. Louis. So immediately like that has a bad connotation for people, um, you know, kind of a dumpy area. It's a two one 800 square feet. Um, you know, this says 90,000. I was operating under the impression it was around 100,000 uh, in terms of a scope of work. 
Um, you know, again, this this comes to that that scrutinizing the exit strategy. I didn't even really like play out in my head what the rehab was going to be. In, in my mind, they were refinancing their their um, their pr- primary residence and getting cash from that and paying me off. Now, a- another thing that I learned is if refinance is ever mentioned, you know, credit report, um, income statements, uh, you know, proof of funds, all of those things are critical to show what is the financial status of this borrower. Um, you know, they did. Like I said, they they were working with someone in our community to get a credit sponsor, and so eventually, as we were getting towards other exits, um, there was a scope of work around twenty five to thirty k, um, and comps that were anywhere between one hundred to one hundred and thirty. Um, so the fact that I took such a hit on it was because after I had people come and look at it and see that there was mold issues downstairs and that the windows were busted and the roof needed to be redone and the HVAC didn't work. And I mean, it was like one thing after another, that wholesale price kept going down and down. Um, and, you know, again, I, I probably could have stayed in this, figured out a way to, to rehab it and kept it as a section eight or something um, because it was in a self-directed IRA dealing with the custodian is, is, even just on doing a note and something straightforward is a real headache. Um, that's also why this deal is kind of painful because not only is it a loss, but it's a tax-free money loss. Um, so it was in a Roth IRA, but you know, there will be other deals. We'll, we'll make that back. Um, so, I mean, that's the, that's the nuts and bolts on it. On it. it was really hit or miss in terms of um, having good comps. Um, and so I think, Looking back, what would I do? Um, I talked to more realtors in the area. I talked to other investors who who work this area and find out, you know, would they do this deal if they were to take it back as is? What would they sell it for? Um, I would have. I didn't have a full scope of, of pictures of the interior, so um, that's another thing that I always require. Um, and I know because we've we've worked on other deals, Eric, that you're always requiring a, an appraisal uh, or some, you know, va- validatable third party um, assessment of what the property is worth. Um, so, yeah. And so were you when you were initially kind of looking at it, Gray, were you not? Um, it sounds like there was rehab that needed to be done to the property, but you weren't super concerned with the rehab because the exit was coming from the refi and you weren't providing any of the rehab money, correct? Correct. But it was a hundred, you know, I did provide a hundred percent of the purchase price. Um, so again, another learning would be don't do that. Um, you know, well, you can, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's so a really kind of friend. Yeah, that's right. So when we are looking at something like this, like we're going to look at what the global ARV is of the collateral, right? So in a situation like this, we would look at what is the value of the the primary residence and what is the value of the collateral property. And we're going to add those together. We're going to see what debt is on there. And then we're going to see how much we're loaning to kind of get a feel of like, how much risk do we have? Like how close to the ARVs of these two properties, or it could be 10 properties, whatever the whatever the collateral bunch is, what is the, the total value and what is the total leverage on the entire portfolio? So so we would look at that globally. So sometimes we will lend 100% like on something like this if there's enough equity on the other and there was. assets. There you know? was. I just think that because they were so unscrupulous and she didn't have good enough credit to do the refinance, which I found out mm. afterward. You know, it was literally like a yeah. few weeks after. It was like, oh, by the way, her credit sucks. He's gotten her into all these deals that are have her LLC on them and, and they've broken up. And, you know, it was just kind of, I mean, it was so mm. dramatic. And I mentioned this before, but as we were, as I was doing the deed in lieu of foreclosure to finally take back the property, um, he was in jail for uh, abusing her. So, I mean, this is a really, um, unfortunately, really sad story. Uh, and I, one of the thing, other takeaways is, uh, you know, I feel like I got screwed by these folks um, and I take a lot of responsibility for that. But one thing that I, I kept in my mind was I need to keep a relationship with um, this woman who's on on the on the paperwork and I need to remain an ally with her no matter how badly burned I feel that I am. Um, and so we uh, 
we continued to talk. I continued to try and be flexible with them. I, you know, I paid for the insurance on this property, um, you know, because I needed to make sure if I was in first position that it was insured. Um, so I, you know, again, I put, I put good money after bad. Uh, I wasn't going to do that on the rehab and, and take it back and do that. Cause I just, I needed to be done with it. But I would say if you're dealing with a problematic lending situation, that borrower is still your partner, no matter how, poorly they're performing and you really need to keep those lines of communication open and be um, flexible. Like I said, I immediately was like, okay, $20,000 might be, might make this deal untenable as a return. Um, I did call the connector uh, and say, listen, you got me into a bad deal. Uh, It's my fault. I need you to sign this release that says you agree to cancel your connector fee because I'm just trying to come out of this thing, you know, with my principal, there's no way that you're getting your fee. Um, and he was fine. You know, he was fine with it. He actually has since left, uh, the Gator program and I, nothing nefarious. I think he had personal issues going on. Um, and just another word to the wise connectors are great. I've done connector deals. They are not your underwriters. Uh, yes, they provide underwriting function. They are not an endorsement that the person, the property or the exit is a good deal. Um, and so I, you know, I have to, I actually have another deal that's, that's gone poorly. Um, we don't need to talk about that again, came from a connector in our network. Uh, I do not blame him. It's just, you know, again, luck of the draw. So, um, yeah, I know Eric has some more questions about the deal. Uh, I just want to insert this little tidbit about connectors. Something that we have implemented is that almost exclusively, we require connectors to get paid on the backside because they have no skin in the game and they are increasing the risk of the loan by getting paid at closing. And the value that they have provided is just the, the connecting the dots so we don't feel that people that we're making the capital investment and the capital risk, we don't feel that their interest should be put before ours as the capital investors. So we're structuring where they get paid on the back end when the loan closes. Uh, that aligns our interest that they're connecting us with good borrowers and good deals. We still do our own due diligence, but that puts our alignment of pay in, in the same bucket and not rushing to close the deal to get, to get a check our interests are not aligned um, in that connector getting paid on the upfront on the first closing. So anyways, that was just a little tidbit of something that we've done to try to, you know, align interests for everybody involved in the, in the deal. Yep. Yeah. I like that. That's good. Yep. hundred percent. And, and just another thing on being careful with the deals. Um, you want to be very, very conservative in your estimates of, how much it's going to sell for, how much the rehab is going to cost. You know, after doing the flips I did last year and just with all the uncertainties, just go ahead and guess that it's going to cost a lot more than a well-educated, well-written estimate for rehab. You know, rehab is going to cost more and it's going to sell for less. You know, it's supposed to sell really well. It, everything looks great on paper, but go for less, right? So if it's um, like this house, for example, it's 100 to 130 k let's peg it at 95 to 100k max for our underwriting right assuming that we've seen comps and they're somewhere in that range but we're not sure let's put it 100k max for easy numbers we like to be 70 percent or lower in first so that means that 70k is a max that we would want to go on this but um there's 30k of rehab and maybe even you know 35k when it really comes down to it so let's say that there's 30k in rehab the most the purchase price should be or the most that we would want to put to that before putting any rehab money in just purchase money would be 40 K. Yeah. Because we've got the 40 K for the purchase and then there's 30 more K of rehab to get us to 70 K and that puts us at 70% loan to value on the hundred K. So that's the standard uh, like wholesaling uh, equation, right? Yeah. 70% ARV yeah. minus repairs. Yeah, yeah and, I, and, I, yeah. and I know that you were kind of, you know, betting on this other collateral property is though we would you learn this lesson because you mentioned it already is like we like to look at the deal and see if it's viable for the, the person that's putting the deal together. And if it's not, we, we give them our opinion like, hey, guys, this is a dumpy deal. Like you shouldn't do this deal even if you can raise the money for it, because this is not a good deal 
to be in as the operator or the lender. And here's the reasons why. So we have we, we try to educate the, the borrowers and help them uh, any way that we can. Because, look, let's be honest, we're not going to get 20 percent return from grade A, super high credit awesome borrowers who have done 300 deals, like they're not borrowing money at 20% in four months. So we have to know going in, which I, again, I think you learned some of this, Greg, is like, we got to know who we're dealing with. Like, who is this, the profile of this person that's come borrow money at 20% in four months and really make sure that we're analyzing the deal, but also trying to help them get to that outcome. So did you do any due diligence on the cross collateral property that their primary residence, Greg? Did you like look at ARV and loan balance and like did I you looked, do any due diligence there? Yeah, I mean I, I saw a photo of their loan statement um and I saw the property just on public public records. Um but I didn't have anything securing my interest in that property, right? So and that, that's a question for you guys. If if this is a similar situation, there was two hundred thousand in equity in this other property, um, would you open escrow on that other property and make sure you had a second secured on that? Right. Okay. Yeah, we would leave both properties. Yeah. And we would cancel both mortgages in the event of return. So we would have a lien on on the yeah. on the property that you're lending on and on the second. Here's a word of caution, though. It's probably good that you didn't put the lien on that property um, because this is something that very few people know. And I don't think it's talked about in Gator at all, but um, or very little is, is that you we cannot from a, a private lender standpoint, unless we have a loan license, a, a loan officer license in that state, do anything that would be considered a consumer loan. Yep. So a consumer loan is primary residence. Right. A consumer loan is money that they're even refining to pay off credit card debt and stuff. So like anything that has to do with consumer spending or their primary residence, that is not something that we can do without having a license uh, in that state. So that's something that we didn't know at the beginning. And we looked at some deals like that. And so me and Eric kind of learned that along the process of like, if they say, hey, I have all this equity in my primary residence, we're like, that's awesome, but we can't use it. If you can go refinance and get it out. That's great. But we can't put a lien there because we're not loan officers in those states. And then you get into usury laws and all that stuff, which you avoid whenever you're doing commercial transactions or business to business like like this. Deal. Yeah. And that's part of the Dodd-Frank Act and, and all of that, you know, yeah. predatory lending and everything. So. Yeah. On that same note, Logan, so in, in regard to just cl- cross collateral of a personal residence, does that also kind of bleed into the territory of a personal guarantee as well? Or, you know, because no, no, the personal guarantee is going to be separate. The, the personal guarantee is them <clears throat> guaranteeing the, this this business transaction personally, which is a separate deal because we we're making a business deal or a business loan. If they want to, you know, do that, then that's we're not. They're volunteering that in, in in a default situation. We're not going after that. Is how the court would look at it. Okay. Yeah. She since foreclosed on that primary residence. So, you know, it, I, I'm telling you like the, the whole, this lady's whole life has kind of fallen apart since we started this deal. So I, I really, um, I really feel for her. Uh, and you know, I, I consider taking legal action to try and recoup what I'm losing for selling this, but I know that she's already being sued by other people in the community. So, um, yeah, it's really, it's kind of ugly. There was 200 K of equity Like a a lot of cases, you know, people get into a home and they stop making the payments and like, you know, there's very little equity. They, they got in for 200 K, they owe 200 K, they get foreclosed on, there's not much equity left. Um, But but in this case, there was $200,000 of equity and she got foreclosed on. So she just lost all of that 200 K. You know, I didn't really dig into what, like, I actually heard that she got foreclosed on or lost it from... Uh, someone else in our community who had been burned by these people. Um, so, you know, it's hard to really uh, dig too much in the story. And, and I don't know what was really true. I mean, at one point I was told that the guy had had a stroke and, you know, it's just, it was, uh, it was truly a, a made for TV saga. Why didn't she just sell the property? I don't know. Good question. I mean, I, that's what, that's what I told her she needed to do to pay, to, to pay me off. And, you know, again, I didn't dig into the details of why that didn't happen. I don't know what was going on behind the scenes. I don't think that she's the savviest uh, uh, business person. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know. Mm. A lot of questions. <clears throat> uh, they also had a tenant in this property. So they put someone in, you know, my property right after they bought it with a bad lease. And, you know, St. Louis city has, um, you know, all sorts of licensing that you have to do to have a tenant in there. The person lived the whole summer without AC. And, you know, I had a phone call with this guy as we were getting towards the end of the thing. And he just sounded, um, really, uh, you know, burned and, and, and traumatized by what had happened. There was mold going on in the basement. So, um, you know, we both were able to kind of share, you know, we both were like, I'm really sorry that happened to you. And he's like, I'm really sorry it happened to you. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been helpful in terms of letting me show the property to, to potential buyers. So yeah. what made you, um, what made you forego the gut check you had with the borrower? Um, FOMO, I think really great return, you know, over, th it was 74 K and 20 back. So it was, you know, incredible return. Um, uh, just this magical sort of word of cross collateralization just seems like, Oh, that's, that's fine. Look at all this, you know? Um, but I will never, you know, we had had a conversation, me and this guy, uh, and you know, he seemed okay. He was easy to talk to, but there was still just something off about it. Uh, and I learned later that he's, you know, on parole and all sorts of weird stuff. Um, and then, you know, again, I think the connector sort of endorsement, um, now I didn't ask what sort of relationship he had with them. Um, and, you know, so again, that's kind of where I have a bit of resentment towards this other guy, but, uh, again, I'm, I'm responsible for the decisions that I make. But I will, you know, I think that uh, Zoom calls with video are going to be super important. Just long, long conversations about personal lives is, is going to be really important. I mean, these are people that you're entering into a partnership with for multiple, multiple months. And I've had, you know, I have another one that thankfully paid off, but um, the person was just completely erratic uh, and completely stubborn, difficult to deal with. Um, and this one deal was also cross collateralized and thankfully it paid off, but, um, I'm also now hearing stories that other people in the community are being burned by this other investor. So, um, really just characters is, is paramount. Yeah. Logan yep. and, and Eric, do you guys have, um, a standard set of questions you ask every single borrower or, um, you know, what I, I, I know last time that we talked, you guys were just getting ready to consider implementing Melissa Palmer as part of your process. Um, so maybe you could tell a little bit about your process of specifically vetting borrower again um, and update us on how that's going for you guys. Yeah, for sure. So I just, when you're doing deals, are you doing something new or different? There's two things that could be going on, right? You're going to feel some anxiety and uncertainty. And I was talking to somebody about this yesterday and you have to make a determination if you're nervous because this is a new venture or a new deal, or maybe you're going at a scale that you've never gone to before. Let's say you used to loan a million dollars. Now you're going to go to 10 and then there's unsafe people, right? And the, the newness of doing something different or outside of your comfort zone and the unsafe feeling of a person can feel like the same thing a lot of times. And a lot of times we have those checks, but we don't know. It's hard to decipher um, if it's the person or if it's just our inexperience in doing this new thing or, or getting outside of our comfort zone. And what I have found is, and Eric's really, really good at this, is more information will make it clear whether it's the person or whether it is your level of uncertainty, right? So that means more diligence. And the more information we have, it becomes clear, hey, this is a person problem or, hey, we're just nervous because we haven't done this before. Um, but oftentimes, I'm very much like you, Greg. I'm, like, I'm a gut check guy. Like I, If I get a gut check, I'm like, Eric, something's up here. And like, so we dig in a little bit deeper whenever I have those checks about something that's going on and with the deal or the person. Yeah. I mean, I have a, um, I put together this like Google sheet that I give to everyone 
to just kind of collect all the information about a deal. And one of my tests now is if I send you this sheet and you send it back to me and it's a quarter filled out, you're not providing these documents that I want and you can't make a Google Drive folder and you know throw a, a CMA on there or something or a purchase sale agreement, then how are you going to be in terms of getting a rehab? So, you know what I mean? It's like a great litmus yes. test. Um, yes. to, you know, mm-hmm. to say, Hey, just, just fill this out, ping me back when it's done. And, um, you know, if someone really dives into it and, and goes the extra mile, then, then we can have a zoom call and really, really dive in. Um, so, and so far no one's really passed this test. So I, I haven't, you know, <laughs> done too many yeah. loans in a while because I'm still, no, we've got a very similar thing. We've got an Asana form where the people fill it out and, and we've seen, completely butchered asana forms like something that's just oh my gosh it's like i want two hundred thousand dollars there's some sort of property somewhere in florida and like i was like where's the detail in this come on guys like that's like i'm not sure this person's going to be able to execute on this and then there's other times when we see it filled out and it's just fabulous there's tons and tons of pictures details huds appraisals everything makes sense like okay this person was prepared to request private money. So mm-hmm. that definitely makes a huge difference. Um, and, and I, I give credit to Logan cause he's got incredible spidey senses when it comes to like, something's off here, something's not right. So many times we've talked with some sort of borrower who wanted money and, and Logan was the first person to notice like something's a little bit off here. And then two weeks later we found out that something blew up in another investment where it was very, very bad. So he's, he's really good at that. Um, with these kind of loans, you've got to be very, very careful. I mean, we can even say partnership deals versus loans. Um, sometimes in the creative finance world, we want to find a way to make it work, right? Like, oh, this seller's in trouble. They're getting foreclosed on. Traditional a cash buyer coming in is not going to work because it's too expensive. But, you know, from the creative fi- finance perspective, we're like, well, we can be creative. We can do all these sorts of different mechanisms and options. And then it's a win-win for everybody, right? So in that spirit... Um, sometimes when we see deals that don't look quite right or they wouldn't really fit for us, I get a gut reaction of, okay, well, let's twist this knob. Let's pull that lever. Let's kind of change around this deal and find a way to make it work because it can still be really good and secure and profitable for us. But, um, that can be a very dangerous line of thinking if you take that to the extreme. So that, that's where I've learned a lot from Logan, because if we've got to pull so many knobs and levers and change up the deal so much, you know, if it's if it's not a good deal, if it's a bad borrower, bad collateral, that stuff, you know, there's no sorts of levers or knobs you can pull. You just got to get away from it. So uh, to, to really do a lot of good deals, it takes a little bit of balance of both. You can't just back off at the, the first thing that's not really looking right, but you also can't try to manipulate it to the point where it becomes a good deal because some deals just aren't good deals and you got to walk away. Yeah. I would argue that most deals aren't good deals. And the greatest thing that we have as investors, the greatest mindset, especially as private money lenders is there is always another deal. So I never feel pressure to rush into a deal or get into a deal because I've just done so many that capital preservation is the number one thing. The returns are awesome, but like, Capital preservation is the number one thing that we're after. And if there's anything, any inkling that that is going to be in jeopardy is like we're past them because there's always another deal. If you're watching this right now and you just joined or you're super excited and you have money, like there's always another deal. Real estate transactions are never going to stop happening in every single economy and every single like they're, they're never going to stop happening. There's always going to be people that need money for real estate deals. There's always another deal. Make sure that you're very comfortable and you're following those gut checks um, whenever you're getting into a deal, especially your first one. And loan to own, right? Loan to own. Loan to own. Yeah, there's been several ones that we've had that came across that, um, you know, um, me and Eric have like really, really liked everything about the structure of the deal. We've liked the, the borrowers in some of these cases. And their assets are just stuff that we don't want to own. And like they're inside the parameters of what we want to do as far as like loan to value and collateral and all those things. But it's like, 
a hotel at some random place. And he was like, well, we're not hotel operators. We can't take this asset over and exit it in worst case scenario. So like, it's not something that we're going to loan on, even though it could be a great loan because we don't have the skill set to take that collateral over and realize the gain in worst case scenario, you know? Yeah, there's another example of two. Like, if you look just by the numbers, there was a property in Louisiana that was multifamily that, like, the numbers actually looked awesome. Like, you know, it's, it's, you got to buy it at a really good price and it's a lot of rehab. It's a major project. After all that, you'll have a really good asset. But the question is, like, do we want to dedicate so much of the next few months and perhaps even years of our lives towards that. Because if that deal went bad, we got stuck with the asset. That is a massive, massive job to rehab that huge apartment complex and get the good tenants in it. That would basically be Logan and I's full-time job if we had to take that over and turn it into a good asset. So like, do we want that job? And the answer is no. So even though the, the numbers were good, we said, we said no to that. So another thing that Logan's really good at is just talking us out of a loan. If there is any single way that you can talk yourself out of it, then talk yourself out of it. Because the best, like the cream rises to the top, you know, the best ones that we've done, there was nothing that we could do to talk ourselves out of it. And they're the ones that work the best. Yeah. I love that. That was, that was a takeaway I had from our first episode for sure. Like I, um, I was trying to form my own opinions and my own process around uh, private money lending. And I think you, Logan said that talk yourself out of the deal. And if you can't talk yourself out, then maybe loan on it, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. I love that philosophy. And we do. I'm oh, sorry, Justin, to answer your question from earlier, I don't think we fully answered that is we do, we do use Melissa um, for some deals. So it, we really are just, um, it, it depends on the situation and but we will use her on some deals, especially again, if there's some stuff that we feel like is a little bit gray or it's a much bigger loan volume, you know, a higher loan amount, we'll bring Melissa in to do that due diligence. Um, and it's been beneficial to us. We've avoided a couple landmines um, that we were uncertain about with Melissa's help. So I love it. Well, and that probably that dollar amount that that, you know, you said some higher loan values, I would just like to just maybe mint make it note that you guys have a lot more capital to go and deploy. So the dollar amount might be different than what it is for other uh, lenders in the Gator community. Some Gators only have 30,000. So their total Mm -hmm. capital could be deployed on one bad deal and then they're out. Yeah. Or or (laughs) their total or their total, uh, their total um, business line of credit which they're responsible for paying back could be gone on one deal. So if you're, if you're loaning a business line of credit (laughs) on a deal, um, and even if the deal is only 30,000, I would say, this is me. My recommendation would be don't ever lend on a deal without going to Melissa. If that's your total capital and you're risking your business's credit line, don't ever do a deal without Melissa. That's right. And if they don't have the money to pay Melissa, that is, here's your sign. This is not a deal you should do. If they don't have the liquidity to do that simple thing, like then that's not somebody you want to loan money to, you know? For sure. For sure. It it also simplifies the process a lot because, you know, the, the ideal scenario is private money lenders for Logan and I and Greg, for you, for all of us. The ideal scenario is that we just get flooded with really, really high quality deals. And then we're basically just underwriting them, right? We're seeing which ones we like the most and which ones are the most secure, which ones we're funding, right? We don't want to get stuck up on doing little bits and pieces of processes that take our focus away from everything else. So when we're in that situation where it's like, eh, I'm not really sure about this borrower or something here is in the gray area, something's a little strange or different. You know, we could ourselves dive into that and go down the rabbit hole and start collecting tons of information. But if there's a third party that can do that service really well and the borrower is paying for that third party, then we have no financial risk. And it's a huge time benefit for us because we're not even going to look at that deal any further until they get a green light from the third party, from Melissa in that case. So it just takes the whole burden, the whole time burden off of our plate until they finish that process. Yeah, I love it.
and maybe this is a takeaway for our our gators if you're new to the gator community and you're seeing these deals um you've already heard talk yourself out of it <laughs> and if you can't talk yourself out of it maybe lend but i think the other thing is you need a process that's the other thing i'm taking away from this is you know we we often see that a connector connected us to this deal and we almost i feel like a lot of newer gators may look at that as it's underwritten and it's not. So if you don't have a process to underwrite it, then you need to have somebody who can help you underwrite that. That needs to be either a skilled underwriter or another private money lender who's skilled at doing this. And it's okay to split your fee with somebody who's going to underwrite this for you and keep you safe. And look, I I think that I I don't want to speak for Greg, but I know that me and Eric are, like, we just love this. And I feel like Greg's heart is the same. Like, we love this. We love this business. And we love helping people. So, like, there, it's not even a, a fee thing for us. It's like, hey, we just want to help you make a good decision. If you're feeling uncertain about a deal, bring it to us. Like, we'll give you our opinion on it just so you don't have to go through this experience that that Greg went through. And it's like, we want to help. And we don't mind looking at deals um, to help people avoid some of these mistakes, you know? You heard it. You heard it from the man himself right there. So don't be hesitant to go and ask for help, guys. I mean, this that's the power of the, of the community that we have is that we do have some experts in the community. So network like crazy and find those those um, experts and leverage them to keep yourself safe for sure. Yeah, this kind of reminds me. And, and sometimes, you know, they think like, oh, I don't want to bug Logan and Eric. I don't want to take an hour of their time. You know, once you've done so many of these deals, I've seen a lot of them where they bring a deal to me and then like in three or four minutes, I'm like, hold on, hold on. This is a big no. And here's why and you just immediately start seeing the red flags. You're like, you didn't even need an hour of our time for us to see like, hold on, you need to be really careful about this. This is a huge no. Um, it reminds me of a short term rental mentorship that I did before getting into Gator when I was getting you know new into the short term rental world, starting my first few in Florida. Um, one of the mentors there was known as the dream killer, (laughs) but she was a dream killer in a very good way because all the newbies like me, like I I saw this private Island on a lake in Florida and it was like a super low price. And I was like, Oh my gosh, we'll put a cabin there. It'll be amazing. And then just in like one line, she's like, you know, that is a dumpy, nasty lake. There's a reason it's cheap. Nobody's going to go to your Airbnb. There's going to be a massive hassle to build anything there. Don't do it. You know, just like, instantly she could look at whatever our crazy new ideas were and she was a dream killer because just in one sentence she could like boom chop it out like don't buy that airbnb it's gonna be bad so not that logan and i want to be the dream killer but like we can help you get out of a bad deal and it probably won't take an hour to really look at it most times i i can vouch for that i mean the very first deal that was brought to me uh eric um just happened to be somebody I was networking with that week. And I was like, Hey, you're, you're experienced with PML. What about this deal? And it took him like five minutes, five freaking minutes to go and pull it apart and say, well, here's red flag. One, two, three, four, five. Here's how to address this red flag. Ask this question. If he responds this way, then you're out. If he responds this way, then you can negotiate and you can always ask me another question if you need to. But I mean, it was just like, Oh, great. Cool. All right. (laughs) So that's awesome. Cool. Um, Greg, do you have any other questions for them uh, that uh, about where were you when I needed you? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, I, I, you know, Eric and I have have done one deal together and I'm really looking forward to, to doing more with, with really savvy, smart people. So um, no, I mean, it's just, it's, it's good to to talk about this stuff and really, um, if anything, I have to keep reiterating it so I learn for the future, but I, I'm hoping for it to be a, um, a dream killer for all the newbies out there. Uh, and the other thing is just like, I, I don't think I bounced this deal off of anybody else. Uh, and that would have probably, you know, so so pick your pick your friends and make sure they're they're really cynical because in this business, you you need cynical, you know don't need people who are going to overlook flags to say, Oh, well, that'll probably be all right. And I think that I tend to be one of those people because I, I want, you know, to get into those opportunities, but, um, anymore. I'll tell you about a, an experience I had at WealthCon. I had a, 
uh, one of the staff there went and um, introduced me uh, to somebody that they had literally just met. It was, so it wasn't, you know, they don't really know much about this person, but they were just like, Hey, yeah, I heard this person does like, you know, I can, I can, uh, he can connect you to capital and this person needs capital. So, you know, talk. And, um, so I, I was talking with this guy and I was like, well, tell me about your deal. And he's like, well, yeah, I got this, uh, I got these two houses that, uh, I, I, I have a private money lender that, that I borrowed from to go and do some rehab and, um, I can't get them refied now. So I'm kind of, I need to cash them out. I was like, well, um, what's your exit strategy for the other PML that's cashed out, cashing out this current one? Well, um, he's like, I, I, I mean, they should, they should appreciate it. I was like, mm, uh, okay. Um, I was like, what's what's your what's your security for them? Um, he's like, well, I have a bed and breakfast that's got a ton of equity in it, and and we could cross collateralize it with that. And I was like, oh, interesting. And uh, I said, uh, you know, um, what's your credit like? And he said, well, that's the other thing. You know, I'm, I'm five hundred. And I said, um, well, a low credit doesn't necessarily mean that you couldn't be loaned to by a P- PML, but it's more like, why is it low? So do you have any idea why it's low? He's like, well, you know, I run this bed and breakfast and the, you know, I bills sometimes, you know, it fluctuates. And I was like, oh, so you're, so you're late sometimes. Okay. Interesting. And, um, I said, why, why, why hasn't your private money lender just gone and, um, foreclosed and just taken over the deal? And he's like, I, I said, he does have a security, you know, he's got a lien on your property. Right. And he's like, well, he thinks he does. I was like, okay, well, great talking with you. Sayonara, brother. Wow. <laughs> he's like, well, wow. we could at least meet over lunch. I was like, I'm really not interested in having lunch with you. But uh, yeah, oh, peace so out. Great. Peace out. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was all he was all around there <clears throat> looking for private capital. Um, mm-hmm. Hopefully nobody gave it to him, but... <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> Eric, let me let me just ask uh, you this question. In your experience, um, you know, what are some of the top priorities that um, the best practices that you top that you prioritize for your uh, deal analysis? Like, what is what is what are some of the first things you look at? Um. If I had to just say one thing to live or die by, you know, there's obviously a lot that you need, but the very first thing is loan to value, right? You need to, you need to be very, very skeptical about how much it's really worth. You know, every borrower thinks they've got the Taj Mahal. It's not the Taj Mahal. It's not worth nearly as much as a lot of them think it will be. So you need to be loaning way, way below what the property actually is. And then, skeptical on everything else on the rehab budget on their past experience like okay how many of these three bed two bath homes in atlanta have you done like like, and where's the past flip like you've done five of them okay show me the huds show me the pictures like show me all the evidence that you've successfully done these five past ones and they're like oh well it's my first time okay well if it's your first time like do you have another seasoned investor doing it with you you know there's like like past experience be very critical on that. Um, in our previous podcast too, we talked about the five things. Like there's, there's a lot of things that can go completely wrong if you don't have the right security instruments in place. Like even just something as simple as a, a clean title policy, right? Like a clean title and a policy where like you're sure that you're in the lean position you're at. So many new gators don't know, and they loan without even checking that they've got the right title work in. So, title work, homeowners insurance, the deed, all of that stuff. I was just going to say too on that HUD topic, like give me HUDs to prove it. Um, I, I literally saw a text float around in our group. I think it was actually in our, our group, Greg, of somebody who, uh, well, it was, it was, it wasn't somebody in our group texting. Right. It was a, it was a screenshot of a text that somebody saw in another group of somebody who offered to pay for HUDs because they needed to get a deal done. And they're like, I'll pay for you know, good HUDs. <laughs> so um, 
Yeah, it is. Crazy. That's crazy. So, you yeah. know, on that note, like, I would just say, be aware there might be somebody who is so bold enough to go and pay for for someone else's HUDs. Yeah. And people you gotta have go even, and verify that that the LLC is even owned by the person that you're working with. Yeah, yeah. Th- there are certain yeah, th- there are certain investment, you know, mentorships and groups that we may or may not be a part of that have posts in them occasionally that usually get deleted where people talk about how to edit a bank statement, right? They're like, oh, this is how you do the pixels. This is how you change the numbers. Boom. And there you've got your proof of funds. You're teaching people to, to lie about their proof of funds. Yeah, that was just up this past week. That was what? It was in one of our Facebook groups. Uh, this and, and it's not the first time. I've seen it multiple times where people are literally teaching you to, to doctor your documents, you know, and that's why it's like a simple phone call. Like, you know, Wells Fargo, whatever says, John Doe has this much, you know, that should be a signed letter by them that has a phone number down there where you can just say, Hey, I just want to make sure this letter is valid. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there, this can get super, super cynical and super negative. And like, I just want everyone that's watching, you know, it's like the heart of this guys is not, we're not trying to be these, investigators we're not trying to be these cynical people like this is just a lot of money to be putting in deals so this is a trust but verify situation absolutely right it is okay to go into a deal being trusting but verifying the information and then you let the borrower and their actions are inactions right on the whatever the objectives are whatever they say they're going to do you let their behavior dictate whether they keep that trust or not right absolutely yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate you bringing that around too, Logan, because it can feel extremely negative and it can start to feel really overwhelming. And again, I think, you know, that's the reason people like Melissa exist. They're there to go and help you verify information yep. and make sure that um, because some of, the, some of these things are not things that we naturally think of. You know, you, Logan, in <laughs> Um, mentioned in the last uh, podcast that we did together that, you know, even just the, the principle of paying back your loans, that was just not something that you ever operated under as a, as an individual, when you borrowed, you just operated under this belief, this is not my money. Therefore I have to pay it back. And <laughs> seems obvious, but, <laughs> um, but apparently is not clear to everybody. And so clearly we, 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 we are going to run into somebody over the course of our time who doesn't operate from that same level of integrity and your job before you go and loan on, on a deal is to try your best to discern the integrity of that person, you know, before you for sure them capital. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we're going to miss. And when sure. we miss, if we underwrote the deal well, we're okay. You yeah, know? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Greg, from your uh, recent experiences, what would you summarize as one really important lesson or key insight that you would emphasize for others? I mean, I, I think I talked about it, but uh, definitely become friends with people who have done more deals than you and ask them to review what you're doing. Uh, that would definitely be uh, job one. And I think um, don't be afraid to ask for references of people that they borrowed money from or done deals with or their contractor or their agent um, and talk to those people. Um, you know, I, like I said, I did connect with someone who I was Facebook connected with, with this borrower and he sort of knew him, but, um, you know, that's, that's not enough. You really need to have people who have borrowed money and been paid back. Um, yeah, I, I want to just add a little tidbit there too. Like if you're feeling that the borrower is being resistant, then they're not being grateful for the capital that you worked hard to get. Right. So if you say, hey, okay, can you give me a reference? Can you give me a CMA? Can you get this? Can you get that? If the borrower starts saying, oh, why do you need that? Or, oh, really? Like I, I did three other loans and they never asked me for that. You know, 
that they're not showing gratitude for the capital that you're giving them. This is your money. So if they start digging in their heels or even insulting you or just being very hard to deal with, yeah. you know, if they're that hard to deal with when they need your money, how much worse is it going to be when the tables are turned and you need to get that money back? So it, it shouldn't feel strained. It shouldn't feel like, oh, it's so difficult to get any information from this borrower. That's, the, that's all the information you need. That's not the right deal to do. Yeah. I love that. Logan, um, have, have you guys experienced any like super challenging deal and uh, maybe one that could have gone south and what are some strategies that you have done to navigate that? I'm talking after underwriting what, you know, maybe it got super late. What are some strategies that you guys have employed to bring that deal to the finish line? Yeah. So we are currently in one of those right now that that's, that's really late. Um, and with some people in the deal that, um, we felt on the front end had a high level of integrity and we still feel that for the most part that these are good borrowers and good people um and we're just in a situation where the refinance is taking way longer and so whenever we get to that point one we're negotiating really high late fees because it's one of the main mechanisms we have is to make it more painful for them for them to complete the deal. So like that's one of the mechanisms is like the late fee renegotiation. So we typically have a normal time frame of a loan. Then we go into late fee period. If we're getting outside of that, we get into the point where we could actually take the properties over and you know they're in default. We will renegotiate and we will try to make it as painful as possible without blowing up the deal or the relationship um, so that they know the urgency that we're placing on this. Um, as well as like we, we talk to them very regularly and the more detail we can get or the more um, direct the information can be, the best it is. So like I'll give you an example, like we started off this deal, we were talking to the loan officer, the loan officer gave us some information that wasn't great. So then we like we're digging further in, we're getting with the borrowers and, and like, hey, guys, like what's going on? And now not only are we not we're talking to the borrowers, but we're talking to the loan processor and the underwriter. So like we literally got on a zoom meeting with the underwriter for the loan to figure out what we needed to get clarity, to make sure that everyone was on the same page. So we don't just take it at face value. Like we're going to try to get as involved as they will allow us for the players in the deal to know if, if what they're saying is actually the truth or not. And in this case, the information the borrowers have communicated to us has been truthful and it's just taking a long time and we're just way into the weeds um doing things that are you know not our job right like we didn't sign up to get this loan like we didn't sign up to work with the underwriters and yet like it's our responsibility to do that um and we want to exactly what gregor said earlier is like we want to be on their same team to get the deal to the finish line because getting the deal to the finish line without default or taking over the property is best case scenario for everybody involved. Yeah. I'm dealing with uh, that now too. It's yeah. It's these refinance, and that's what I was alluding to earlier about. I think credit tightening and things just dragging on longer. Um, but yeah, I've been talking with loan processors, and they actually told me that uh, I needed to resubmit a payoff letter because my late fees were excessive. I'm like. I, I really don't think it's your position to say that a signed contract that I have with the borrower that stipulates what the late fees are, what the JV fee is. It's not, are you going to litigate me for this? Like if you are, then great. If not, like th- those are the terms that are agreed to. So I definitely feel you on, um, and the, and the borrower sort of fallen out of the picture and I'm just calling the loan processor every day. And like, I mean, we're, we're three months late at this point and it's just, it's just costing the borrower, you know, we're, we're trying to help them. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Let me ask you guys this really quick before we, before we close, um, Eric or Logan, you know, what role does continuous education for you guys, um, play in staying up to date with industry trends? Um, and you know, making informed decisions as a lender. 
and, and and where do you seek out that education? I think that there's, you know, in real estate, there's kind of at least two major categories of that type of like, what's the trend in the market or like, you know, home prices going up and down or whatever. There's the whole, you know, global or national economy, like what's the forecasted for the interest rates, what's forecasted for the prices in general. And, and there's plenty of articles, newspapers, you know, just meeting with people who are in that space to know. Um, beyond that, the second space is just really knowing that city well. So that, that's where you've got to be really careful if you're going to lend or buy in a city or an area that you're not very familiar with. You should talk with three or four listing agents and other people who really know that area well, right? So um, just, you know, you should educate yourself about the different laws and foreclosure processes, judicial versus non-judicial, all that is very good too. But then again, like if you're going to loan in middle of nowhere, Florida, or even any city, you know, if you're not super familiar with that city's economics and their trends and home prices too, one city could be going up a lot. Another city could be going down a lot. So just really getting to know that specific area is important too. Yeah. Well, we have that right where, yeah. right where I'm at, you know, the city that I'm in is 7,000 people and it is actually growing a little bit and less than probably three miles away from here is the next city over. And that one is just like shrinking. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's it's real estate's hyper local. I love uh, bigger pockets on the market podcast is good, um, and then there's another one. Um, it's the owners of Fundrise, the founder of Fundrise, called Onward, and he has a really really interesting perspective because he is getting a uh, a front row seat to some of these conversations. Like when uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, like he was in those meetings because of the liquidity that they had in Fundrise. And so he is kind of on the edge, the tip of the spear for a lot of the stuff that's happening in the commercial markets, for sure. Um, Not as much in the residential space. So I guess um, it depends on on where you're uh, – if you're lending in the commercial space or the residential space because the same economic climates act differently upon those different assets because of the credit markets, right? The residential borrowers and the commercial borrowers are different spaces. The house properties are valued or different. So like that, the, the, the asset class that, that you're going to be working in predominantly, you need to learn that asset class. And then also what Eric said, the market, like the, it, we want to be all things to everybody because we want to look at all the deals, but the more niche down you get, the less risk you have. Warren Buffett says that the knowledge reduces risk. So the more knowledge you have of a, of a borrower, of the asset itself, of the area it's in, of the specific area of that city even, the less risk you're going to have in a deal because you have specific knowledge of that area. Um, and I will, uh, but this is one of the things that like, I will always, always, always be a proponent of. The overall economy and stuff, That's like that does matter, but I would rather be in a bad deal with a good borrower than a good deal with a bad borrower every day of the week yeah absolutely character comes first (laughs) that's right i actually i actually just came up with two other questions before we close so (laughs) i hope you don't mind uh eric or logan what are the uh states that you guys absolutely will not lend in uh ever Uh, because i feel like that's important for people to kind of no, and, and and I think everybody should do their own investigation on this, but you got two two phenomenal private money lenders here who are killing it. And uh part of it is there's certain places you guys guys just won't touch with a ten foot pole. So what are the places you absolutely will never lend? So Logan and I know this one. We California is just one of the ones that's notoriously very, very difficult for lenders or landlords to work with. New York is up there as well. Uh, I've heard people say things like, oh, well, if you do the right kind of contract in California, like it's a business entity, then the foreclosure laws are different and it's easier and faster and better. But there's just, you know, I don't, it's like like Logan said, you know, Warren Buffett said, you got to know it well. I don't know the California laws well enough and I've heard enough horror stories and seen enough. And I'm like, you know, this is not something that I'm going to touch 
right now. And we don't like the, I mean, just as a general rule of thumb, uh, blue states uh, and or uh, non-judicial or judicial foreclosure states, right? Like we'd like to stay in the red non-judicial foreclosure states. Um, we will violate that though. Like for example, like Louisiana is a judicial foreclosure area, but I'm in Louisiana and I know the markets very well. So I have a, a, a leg up on, on the competition that would lend here from out of state because I have very specific industry and market knowledge. So if you're a private money lender and you're in one of those maybe blue areas and you're like, man, like, I, I I don't want to I don't know what to do here. People are saying not to lend in this place. I would say that the least risk for lending on deals is in your hometown. So if it's really small like Justin's, maybe there's not a lot of opportunity. We spend a lot of time on social media and Facebook trying to get deals, but one of the best ways to get really good private money loans is to go network in your community that you're physically in, and then you can go drive to the house. You can go put your hands on it. You can go walk through it. You can you can meet the borrower in person. Like that's a way that if you're trying to get your first deal done, like that can greatly reduce risk. Is to is no matter if you're blue, red, judicial, non judicial, like go and find somebody to loan money to in your local community, and because you're going to know that area the best, you know you just. Um, but yeah, the blue states and non judicial states. Um, I'm blue states and judicial foreclosure states are kind of off the list for us. Awesome. And then uh, my last question is, anybody have any words of encouragement or uh, whatever for for anybody who's new that was listening to this and just left this podcast feeling just a little bit overwhelmed now? Um, <laughs> I, I don't want people to listen to this and feel overwhelmed. I mean, we, we we've encouraged you to go to 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 your expert resources. But if you're feeling overwhelmed, I, I, I just like to open the floor to anybody that that wants to share some some encouragement to, to new folks. Do it in spite of your fear. I've literally done hundreds of real estate deals and I just lost $16,000 on a deal because I violated one of my own rules in my own market. Like, all, like literally all the things that I know better than to do. I actually knew the house, knew the neighborhood and I lost $16,000 on a deal um, because I didn't follow my own rules that I have in place. So like you're, there are going to be bumps and bruises and it's going to be scary, but do it anyway. And I think Greg's a, a, te- a testament to that of like, he did it and he had got the bumps and bruises, but he's still doing it. Like that's how you win at this game. Whoever stays in the game the longest wins. So just don't quit. Yeah. I, I think for me, um, you know, I see a lot of people going down the whole business credit route looking for these EMD deals because they only have a couple thousand dollars to get into it. I'm not a huge fan of the whole EMD route just because I think that it's working. It's a very erratic game. Uh, and so I think PML is a better world to tread in. And if you don't have that capital, the connector role is definitely somewhere that you can lean into. But please do not be someone who is just taking an opportunity and blasting it out. Um, get a sheet, you know, hit up and look at what Eric's looks like on, on his Asana form, which is great. I know my friend Jonathan Pechmachu has a really nice jot form. I have mine, which I'm happy to share. And that'll give you experience, you know, figuring out what you need to ask and and getting that keen eye of poking holes in things and, and talking yourself out of deals. And you should definitely evaluate five to 10 of those before you ever start to lend money. And, you know, the connector, uh, I think the connector avatar and the role within PML is a way to start generating capital um, before you have your own to lend. You just, uh, first you have to understand how to, how to bet the deal. Yeah. And you can, you know, sweat equity. If, if you find a connector who's doing a lot of really good deals or private money lenders and you want to say, Hey, I want to help. I want to learn. You might work alongside them. You might go to the same Zooms as them. You might even offer to call up a potential prospect list or try to find potential new clients for them and, you know, maybe not make a whole lot of money or zero for a while, but you can build relationship equity there where you're helping them out and bringing them more business and then learning from them and their processes. The other positive thing I want to say, which was one of the highlights of our last podcast is that if you've underwritten the deal properly, even if things go south or the market turns a little bit, if you've got the right security instruments, the lender is usually one of the safest spots to be. 
right? Because the borrower will lose money. The contractor could miss out. You know, th there's all sorts of people who could lose money or not do well in the deal. But if there's enough equity and you've got the right instruments on that house, then the lender's in the best spot of everyone. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I was just going to close with this thought here. Ryan Pineda said this, and I wrote this down because I loved it. He said, business is simply a game of odds. You can't control the outcome. All you can do is control your process. So um, Logan alluded to it. You know, he broke his process and and it, it, it impacted the outcome. And uh, so I love that. Um, we are in a in a industry that carries risk. And so um, if you don't have the stomach for risk, then maybe this isn't the place for you. But if you're feeling fear, lean into it, you know, because I said it on my my little introduction. I, I, I recorded an introduction to this season two and what I'm wanting to kind of um, highlight over this next season is that really everything good that you've ever wanted is ultimately on the other side of fear, you know. Um, anything we do in life, I mean... Even if even if you're going the traditional route, going to college, there's there's an element of fear to that. There's a lot of fear that you have to overcome when you go to uh, college and get through get through classes and whatnot. So, fear fear is uh, shouldn't be a thing that prevents you from pressing forward. Um, it should be it should be the very thing that actually causes you to lean into it. So, that would be my encouragement. Well, Greg, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for sharing your you. uh, insights, your experience. I'm sure this is going to be helpful for somebody. I know our last episode with Eric and Logan was one of our top episodes. And actually, I, I continue to get messages from people saying, uh, thanks for putting that on. I don't know about you and, er and Eric, but um, uh, I continue to get those messages from people who watch that episode and chose not to do a deal and found out that the deal went bad uh, because of listening to your, your, um, your instruments that you, you use to keep a deal safe. So um, I don't know in the comments below folks, write down whether or not you want to hear some more from uh, Eric and Logan as well. Um, I know we'd love to have them come back on and even talk about different types of private money lending uh, that you could do that you could market out to the community or you even as a connector could market out to the community and bring to them uh, and make make money bringing them the kind of deals that they they like so um i'd love to have them back on and and uh, specifically talk through those deals so that you you know how to market those um well thanks again for your valuable contributions to all three of you and your expertise in today's discussion uh, to our dedicated listeners, I appreciate your time and engagement, and I hope that Greg's journey and the insights shared uh, by our guests, Eric and Logan, have been of both inspiration, inspirational and informative uh, uh, in your own endeavors and investment journey. Um, remember, in this dynamic landscape of wealth building, continuous learning and self-investment are certainly key, and your journey is a testament to your dedication we, we look forward to bringing you more enriching conversations in our upcoming episodes of Nursing Real Wealth. Take care and God bless.